Hi everyone, welcome to the second week of the Pacific Salmon Awareness Project. Today we're covering species, species invasiveness, so we are covering the impacts and management of invasive Pacific Salmon in northern Canada. So firstly we have impacts on native fish. Uh, the main impact here is biotransport. So essentially Pacific Salmon when they're in the ocean and other waterways will bioaccumulate contaminants in their bodies. So essentially, the smaller organisms that they eat contain contaminants, and then the ones above those contain contaminants, and then the Pacific salmon eat them and they become accumulated within them. Um, this ends up being transported to native fish in the areas that they invade, uh, mostly because native fish will consume their eggs, um, and then that will restart the bioaccumulation process. So in this example, which was a study in the Great Lakes in Lake Michigan, um, the Pacific salmon were introduced instead of um, naturally invasive, but there was bioaccumulation of contaminants from the introduced Pacific salmon, and this ends up having effects outside of the salmon's invaded habitat, because the salmon will move, but also the smaller fish will move, and um, that results in bioaccumulation in habitats surrounding the initial invaded area as well. And generally, um, as expected, the toxins increased mortality of native fish. So they also found that um, Pacific salmon will compete for breeding ground with native fish, which obviously makes it harder for the native fish to continue breeding. Um, and they also spread non-native diseases, viruses, and parasites. So the picture on the right is of a nematode, which uh, they do uh, carry along with trematodes and cestodes. And some of the infectious agents that were found in BC in Pacific salmon uh, were Candidatus brachiomonas cysticola, Paranucleospora theridion, and Parvocapsula pseudobranchiocola. And all of these contribute to gill, brain, heart, and liver diseases within the fish um, and can be passed on to native fish in the area. So, um, yeah, it's a pretty big effect that these fish can have when they're moving into a new area. And those three that were listed were the most prevalent um, and heavily contribute to deaths of native fish in BC in this study. So lastly, there are um, some obviously very negative effects of Pacific salmon in environments, but they can also have some positive effects depending on how you look at things, which calls into question, um, you know, what their, their effects might be in the future because the instances of Pacific salmon in the Arctic are pretty few at this point in time, but are anticipated to increase as climate change goes on. Um, so as we discussed before, eggs do provide a food source for native fish, which can be positive in the fact that they are provisioning food for native fish, but if they're passing on these contaminants and diseases, that's quite problematic and can result in fish mortality. Um, they also disperse nutrients and alter stream beds during spawn, so they're changing the, the morphology of the rivers. Um, and they also provide food for bears, which once again is sort of a catch-22. They're providing food for bears, but they can also contain a lot of contaminants from bioaccumulation in other waterways. And they do increase the concentration of marine-derived nutrients. So in this study, uh, they were looking at nitrogen-15 and carbon-13. Um, and by looking at those isotopes, they know that those are coming from the ocean. And those become increased when Pacific salmon move into the area because Pacific salmon gather those nutrients when they're in the ocean um, and then bring them into new waterways when they are consumed. Hi everyone, it's Jennifer Gast here again. Um, so this week we're going to be talking about uh, some management methods, but first I'd like to mention a little bit about the legislation in Canada because it is the legal foundation for how we manage and prioritize our actions. Uh, it, it's a little confusing for me because reading legal documents isn't really my strong suit, but here's what I found. Um, in the Fisheries Act, the purpose of this act is <laughs> to provide a framework for proper management and control of fisheries, as well as conservation and protection of fish and fish habitats, uh, including by preventing pollution. So in the middle here, I'm just gonna summarize what I found at this little screenshot here. 
about invasive species. Um, in the regulator regulation section 43.1, um, that allows the governor and council to make regulations for carrying out the purposes and provisions of the act. Uh, there is a part that mentions aquatic invasive species and respecting the management and control of aquatic invasive species. So this includes regulations about prevention, possession, release, handling, treatment, and eradication of such species, as well as respecting the powers of a fishery officer and the fishery guardians to manage and control the species. Um, so from all of this, my understanding is that this gives power over to the local or provincial slash territorial governments to create an identification slash management plan for invasive species. Uh, in the Northwest Territories, a, a biodiversity action plan was created outlining the need for documenting the full range of species. Uh, and the government in Northwest Territories knows they lag behind in preventing the introduction of invasive species in our area. Uh, and this could threaten native ecosystems, habitats, and other native species. Uh, but there is a general lack of knowledge and research on invasive species potential, mostly because uh, they take for granted that our northern climate is what prevents most species from establishing up here. Um, this was set in 2006 and a new report is supposed to be coming out sometime this year in 2022. It, it was hard to find a lot of uh, research related to this just because like they said they don't have a lot of information and the new report is supposed to come out this year and uh, yeah so uh, a lot of the links that I tried to find just brought me to dead ends, um, but on the NWT species info base, they do list the pink, chum, coho, chinook, and stockeye salmon as vagrant species, meaning that their presence in the Northwest Territories is outside their normal habitat range, which we explained uh, in the first week with regards to their species distribution. Um, so more information on the general range of biodiversity uh, and abundances and distributions of the environment up there needs to be published in the north from the Northwest Territories so that the effects and impacts of global warming caused Pacific range expansion, uh, Pacific salmon range expansion can be accurately documented. So at the moment, there are no real management management methods specifically tailored for specific salmon, uh, Pacific salmon <laughs> in the Northwest Territories because they are vagrant and not very well established yet. We are still trying to figure out uh, what their impacts are. Uh, so Pacific salmon are an ocean faring migratory species. Uh, whose range is so extensive that we also cannot effectively control where they will go. So that makes it really hard uh, to accurately predict where salmon will be, and uh, especially if you're not expecting it outside their natural uh, range, like the Northwest Territories. So the best management strategy over the last few years have been to inform community members and listening to the a local indigenous population who hold the traditional ecological knowledge of the area. They are especially, uh, especially informative because they see the changes that go on in the water firsthand, um, especially if they fish regularly along the Mackenzie River, which uh, we will be talking about right now. So my interest for this topic actually came from a Facebook post I saw a few years ago from a community member uh, back home. And um, uh, I sent her a message not, not too long ago asking her about this again. And uh, so like of the thousands of things that I could remember, this is the one thing that stuck out for me. Um, so Dawn, Dawn Bell Isaiah, she was out at her family's cabin at Martin River, which is 
just outside Fort Simpson, which you can see on the right side. It's like really, really far, far south uh, compared to the Arctic Ocean, which is like about a thousand kilometers more north. It, Fort Simpson sits along the 61st latitude and at the confluence of the Liard and Mackenzie River. So if you want to look that up later, uh, go ahead. Um, so it, it, it was really strange that there was salmon so far down the Mackenzie River. And um, yeah, so she she didn't tell me which species was mentioned, but it definitely looks like a Pacific salmon. And so the picture on the top was taken September 11th, 2017, and the bottom was taken two years later, September 9th, 2019. Oops, sorry, 2017 and 2019. Um, and she had told me that the first one that they caught in 2017 was like really aggressive and left holes in their fishing net as well as like kind of injured themselves, like injured their jaw and stuff. Um, so they, they said that they sent their fish off to environment and natural resources, uh, to, for the researchers to study. And this kind of, the fact that she found them both in September leads me to think that they were, and, and they're kind of pink. So it kind of leads me to think that they were trying to find somewhere to spawn for the year and got lost maybe, or they're just finding new places. Um, but so when the locals send their salmon to get sampled, if they send in the head, they will get a $25 gift card. And if they send in the whole fish, they get $50. This program is great because it's all voluntary. So if the locals don't want to send their fish in, they don't have to, it's not, it's not totally mandatory. Um, and it's like up to the community members, whether they want um, you know, the scientific research to go ahead and all that good stuff. Um, and they also get a little bit of money for giving up what is probably a really tasty salmon. <laughs> so it's interesting that since the program has begun, there has been an increase in the number of salmon being caught in exchange for research. Um, from, 20, from the year 2000 to 2017, the Arctic Salmon uh, community-based monitoring program has been an effective way of monitoring salmon presence and um, their distribution and abundances in the Northwest Territories. From the data collected, we can see uh, that there were there were four species recorded. Uh, chum salmon is consistently the most abundant of the four species and are observed to have reproducing populations in the Western Arctic. So that kind of that, that dark black line kind of follows suit. Uh, certain levels ha are seen to have stable low level harvests, while higher level harvests in uh, other years, 2013, 2011, and 2016 and 2017, have shown an uh, increasing trend in their po population. For pink salmon, their populations have also been on the rise, mostly during uh, even calendar years, so like every every second year I guess or every yeah so every second year every four four years um but they have been spotted further up the Mackenzie in Fort Good Hope Northwest Territories which is closer to the Arctic Ocean uh than where I'm from but still still pretty far distant uh stockeye salmon populations have rapidly increased in 2016 and 2017 as you can see by the green dotted line on the graph, um, where in previous years there were less than 10 annual reports of them. Chinook salmon populations are the lowest in this data, reporting less than 5 annually, but in 2016 there were 10 reports and in and 14 reports reported salmon in 2017. Uh, so this shows that the need for continued monitoring is essential uh, for tracking this trend of increasing Pacific salmon populations in the Mackenzie River system. Uh, this trend could also be attributed to the increase in harvest reporting by community members themselves. So the abundances have 
could have been there in the past and more people are just deciding to send their salmon in for sampling. But uh, this also falls in line with the local law, uh, the recent no local knowledge from the people all along the Mackenzie River that say that they have been seeing a greater presence of salmon in their fish nets, and um, this wasn't this wasn't a thing in the past. So, um, thanks everybody for watching, and uh, we will see you next week for our last video. Thank you.